Oh yes, I remember it very vividly. When I got word of it, I was probably under a grease truck up on the north slope where it was 40 or 50 below. When I, when I heard it, it had gone through. Somebody, one of the mechanics, one of the mechanics, uh, we call them wrenches, mentioned to me that he'd heard it on the news. So, in a way, in a way, it was, uh, it was welcome news. It was big news. And we knew that there were going to be a lot of things, a lot of things to do. Because, you know, that was just one part, you know. And the getting together of the people and uniting the people, that was, um, that was, uh, that was the challenge there next. Robert Onquist, he's, he's one of the six individuals that created Cape Fox. It could have been any other corporation name, but they chose Cape Fox Corporation. I got a call from, from Juno, and I believe it was, at, I'm sh pretty sure it was uh, John Borbridge at the time. And of course, he said, we're really worried about, really worried about Saxman because of what the city of Ketchikan is is uh, doing. We need somebody right away before Ketchikan does a bunch of more things to to shut you down. And we talked about it, and he asked me if if I could organize it and and get it off the ground. And it didn't take long. I said. I have the ability to do that. I could do that. I'm going to choose the people. I want people that are like-minded and that want to move ahead. Because if we don't act soon, Ketchikan has lobbyists. They're working with the pulp mill, maybe the spruce mill, and other groups there. And I really don't want them to get to get blocked out because we knew what they were going to do. You know, they already got the 10-mile the thing around there, and it could have gotten worse. So with that in mind, I got busy right away. And, uh, and uh, you know, went and talked to people. I talked to Henry. We, we made up a list of, made up a list, you know, like uh, Bill Olson, Paul Johnny, um, Irene Johnson. I can't remember her name, but um, Andy Denny's wife. And uh, uh, she was, uh, she did a lot of the notes and stuff. And that was the core there. That was the initial core. We were talking about, we were talking about a name. Henry was telling me one time that all of the people would meet in the spring. They would meet at the Naha. And the inland people would cross up by the eunuch. It's really close. And they could have little, not even necessarily canoes, but they could get across there. And they would walk to the Naha, the inland people. And then he said, he said, uh, out of nowhere, he said, Stawa came. Uh-oh. Stawa was even bad to our people. They were a, a group of, they were a group of Haidas actually from, from Southern. And what that referred to, you don't hear that word very often, but it means like witchcraft. They took it as meaning witchcraft. Came at the most inopportune time when they weren't ready. And and took them by surprise. And and those early people there, they pretty much destroyed the place. But they had, they had, they knew that the clan would be saved if they could save 
their crest. And he said they had a big, like a big egg. It was like this, a big egg. And so some of the young men and the people fled inland. And for lots and lots of years, they didn't know what happened to it. But finally, as luck would have it, they uncovered it up in Ginkolath, up in the Nishka. The Nishka are the same, same as Richard people and maybe some others thrown together up there. They wanted to know, what is this? You know, the probably archeologist and they uncovered, uncovered it, and they told them there was probably old people still alive. They told them that came from the Naha when our people escaped there. And then they walked overland, and they walked, uh, you know, walked up. They had trails all over. They could walk right across from Kinkola. And then from there, there the people came back again from there. But, uh, Anyway, the last part of the story was that, and I asked him, what does Naha refer to? And he said it the proper way, but he said, it means nation lake, where all of our people come together. And it used to be at one time a big thing, really, it was huge, where all the, the people came together there. So Henry said, you know, our early beginnings of our people, when we, when we came and, and say we got pushed out by the ice and, and other things happened, we had a village there at Cape Fox. And what the people, the old stories related was when they related and how it's got a nice bite behind it. Even when storming, you can get back in there and get ashore. On the winter storms, they related how, how stormy it would be, the waves and the lashing the beach and the water flying hundreds of feet in the air. You can get ashore there. And so the village would be, would have been tucked in behind a little. But, but I think that's where our beginning will be is there. And uh, I said, Henry, I'll back you all the way on that. I said, that sounds real good. We have a beginning. So I'm going to say a few words about when we first started as a corporation. I just happened to be around when uh, Frank Seaborn and Stella Martin were coming to, to Saxman. And I didn't know anything about corporations or anything. And I just happened to be here. And when I came in and showed them the place, I stood in this area right where I'm at here. Frank Seymour stood here. And Stella Hansen stood here. That worked for us. She was our first employee of the corporation, as well, along with Frank Seymour. And Majority of the windows were knocked out. And there was a cap, uh, kind of like a kitchenette on that side uh, of the building. And things were hanging off the ceiling. The doors weren't able to be locked. And this is where the corporation was first started after they uh, created the corporation. And Frank Seymour's statement at that time was, we are now open for business. And still everything was hanging off and I turned around and left. Again, this is where the corporation started in this area right here as a official business. And I didn't know anything about it, but now I do. And there's a lot of places where I remember I stood and 
the different things that happened as the corporation started. So that's a little bit about, about this, uh, why we started. And the building we're in right now is what they call the old schoolhouse. There were uh, a number of Cape Fox shareholders back in the logging company days that were employed as um, in the tree harvest side of things, in the, in the sawmill, um, and in the transportation of the, the logs, um, bundling them and taking them to the salt water, and then especially in the stevedoring, uh, rafting the logs up in salt water, um, helping uh, lift them onto the ships that would uh, then take the, the, that raw material to, uh, to market. And um, so there was quite a lot of uh, activity in terms of employment of, of shareholders that, that took place during the, that logging era. Fox Corporation. It's the first corporation, village corporation. Keep in mind there were 200 village corporations. First corporation that brought back the culture. Why did they bring it back? Because we have Totem Park. We have over over 100,000 visitors that come annually. Okay. Uh, Clan House was constructed in 71, 78. The intent of the Clan House was to show the visitor how we once lived at one time. We start at an early age. Um, when our parents are pregnant, we are at the dancing, so we get used to the drum beat before we're even born. So that way when we are born, it seems to be the drum where it would scare another child that's not used to it. Our children usually will just go to sleep and be comforted by it. Our uncles and aunts would always tell us to tell us with our kids to just let them roam around and one day they'll just get in line and start dancing and they do. I started out helping build the logging roads up at the Ward Lake on White River and uh, they moved me to the hotel when it was going to be built and I hauled uh, the bigger rocks from the lower uh, part of the hotel to the upper side and then as the progress occurred I got moved in as a to help out with carpentry on the inside with the uh, strand construction and then uh, I went back to driving truck to uh, to haul equipment and then uh, the very last part of that was building the tram, and that was that was quite the job there because you had to be tied off, and it was a steep uh, angle. You had to haul jackhammers and uh, drill holes so that you can uh, make room for the footings for each of the tram feet. So that that was towards winter time. So it was a cold and wet days we had to work, but. Some, sometimes it was seven days a week, and it was mostly shareholder hire. That, that was quite the job. I was around working on the foundation of the lodge itself and working on the um, trim for probably two years. It was a lot of fun working on it, hanging off the side of a mountain with a rope and holding on to a drill and a jackhammer. In building the lodge back in 89, I remember coming in with the labor union and Cape Fox had its um, hiring preference with the native shareholders first and then descendants and being a shareholder was able to work with them when they 
building the lodge up from the foundation, digging the holes, uh, doing the tramway, part of the tramway, uh, jackhammer leg and moving the rock out and then building up the, building it is from st sticks, but the uh, adjacent buildings are modules, so those are hoisted in and remember doing the couple jobs right at that time, working the tramway and at the lodge. Then Moonlight as well as the cashier job. So it was quite a few jobs at the time. I was hungry, moving forward and doing something, keeping the cash flow. That the workers in the kitchen and the, the, the people that are working in the restaurant, <clears throat> we would have to go up at 10 because they needed to learn how to do their job. So we got served lunch and stuff at noon, or coffee breaks at 10, then we got served lunch and then we got served uh, again at three o'clock break. So not only did we help them, they helped uh, the servers learn to their job outright. And then each time a, a section was built, they would, they would have a party and it, it just went in different uh, sections. What was amazing to me was the operator, Jim Scholl, when he was digging climbing alongside the mountain itself and moving the rock and digging the holes with his uh, excavator. And when he moved that excavator alongside the mountain, down on the tramway on the hillside of the hotel it was amazing how he could track that across and still dig and still function <laughs> and still breathe. But when he does stuff like that, it just shows me how competent and confident he was and what he was able to do and stuff like that just blew me away. It shows me how much more I had to learn when people will that confident be able to do things like that. As the head of the, um, all the laborers that work there, on the footings of this, of this hotel, I worked on the tram on all the um, material going out. And as I um, worked with all the laborers, I kind of got an idea of some of them that worked there with me, even my stepson and a lot of my nieces and nephews and that, that worked on there. And as I'm um, working on it, one um, of my brothers were still with us, Albert Shields Jr. and Wishkana, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Shields Sr. Just being able to work with my uncle, um, Harvey at the time, he was the lead down there and running the buggies, running the rock downhill, and then hauling it out. But just be able to work with him and be around the uncles has uh, got to be the priority of what I enjoy. Well, it it was always difficult. And um, with that being said there, safety was always uh, number one. Not only for yourself, but for the whole crew, as far as dealing with big rocks and sending them down and the only way it could go was down and that's what we had to watch for all the time was the rocks and uh, each other. I always had communication on what we were doing all the time and uh, the footings, the deepest footing we dug over on this side here was I think pretty close to almost 15, 15 feet deep. We dug it out by um, shovel and bucket we were digging down far enough to where we hit solid rock and we were drilling holes and jackhammering those holes out afterwards and just moving all the rock where it needed to be moved. We pretty much leveled off that entire top of the hill so we could have a flat surface to build. Elders back then, uh, I remember the time they uh, put their handprints on each corner of the, the meeting room in there. Um, there was uh, a lot of those elders aren't aren't living anymore, but there's been memories. We uh, we've had different parties and meetings up there that involved them. I didn't understand then. Then then I understood later that it was a place for us, which meant a lot because it was like giving us something that we needed. And then where the elders could, could help us. Um, 
Um, we originally came from Cape Fox Island, which is about, I think it's about 30 to 50 miles south of here. The, there was an expedition, it was called the Harry, Harriman Expedition, over 100 years ago. They departed on a large steamship and came through the area and stopped at the Cape Fox village. It was during the time that the uh, inhabitants were off uh, collecting food and, and uh, under, undertaking other activities. So on their way back down from Juneau, they um, went to Kirk Point, um, where, where Cape Fox is located. And at first it was they, you know, the scientist and the, um, the Harriman family got off and they were gonna eat lunch there and and then it was somebody's idea that, well, this village is abandoned and um, let's take some totem poles. And so they, they take in several totem poles and a whole entire clan house. So floorboards, sideboards, the front screen, the totem poles inside, they took everything. And um, this, this was, um obviously a, a, a big surprise and, and a, very, uh, a, a very offensive thing to the, uh, the Sanya Kwan who, who lived there. And a lot of that art, the, the totem poles that were uh, taken, stolen really, from, from the, the people who lived there um, and taken to various museums around the country and so forth were repatriated under a, um, a federal law the, it's called NAGPRA, Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, I believe. So I work for K-Fox Corporation um, doing receptionist um, and they, um, the CEO of the corporation, he um, handed me the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act and he said, um, Irene, why don't you read this? and um, I think we have some artifacts, you know, in some museums. And then he handed me a book, I think it was called The Harriman Expedition. And still 19 years old, um, I read the NAGPRA Act. I must have read it at least, I wanna say 30 times. It started, I was tribal president at the time, and um, I was contacted by a young gal, her name is um, Phoebe Woods. She was the senior vice president of finance for Arco then, and she talked about um, the repatriation of the items to be brought back to um, to Saxman. And she said that uh, because I was tribal president, the, we should. Um, exercise our tribal authority and, and get those items returned. The driving force to the, have the items returned uh, was was um, there was going to be a retrace of Edward Herman expedition, and and um, so the idea of getting those items on that boat that came in the retreat, re, retrace was really the goal. And, and um, so that was to take place in 1998, because 1898 was when they were stolen. And then um, I took the Harriman Expedition book, and clearly you could see some of the totem poles from our village, um, from Cape Fox Village, was in the book. And so I just went to the back of the book, and um, I looked up all the scientists that were in the book, in the back, um, John Muir, um, Edward Curtis. Um, and then I was like, well, what, what did they do with these things? You know, because they said inside the book that they, they take in artifacts or they take in some totem poles. And so um, in the back of the book where it said like Edward Curtis, it said, you know, um, he was not working for the Burke Museum, but he had a relationship with the Burke Museum. And so I then called the Burke Museum and said, um, you know, I work for K-Fox Corporation 
and I'm just researching right now, do you have a totem pole that came from our village? And at the time, um, in about 1995, um, the NAGPRA Act was fairly new because um, it wasn't passed. I think it was passed in 1994 by um, President Bush, number one. Um, and so they said, well, yeah, we have several totem poles there because it's the Burke Museum. It's, you know, the museum in Washington. It has a big Northwest Coast collection. And so I said, well, just, you know, send me pictures of the totem poles that you have. And they did. Um, they also sent me some catalog records. And so I just kind of followed that process and called them on the phone because back then there was no internet where you could research. Um, and so that just led to calling every, every um, mu major museum in the country. We were meeting with um, uh, Dick West, who was the um, uh, executive director or the president or CEO of Smithsonian, and, and uh, so when um, when we got to the luncheon meeting, there was uh, Byron Malott, who was the president of uh, Sea Alaska Corporation, and then the, there was the uh, Fan Ulmer, who was the um, lieutenant governor for Alaska, and at that point I thought, man, this is bigger than I thought it was going to be. After uh, we were sitting there for a few minutes, Byron had his, uh, had his little intro and he said, uh, the real reason we're here is because Joe wants to tell you something. Keep in mind, we never conversed as to what I should or shouldn't say. And um, so Joe, it's all you. And um, so my immediate response to that was, well, I'm here to get all the items that were stolen from our village back. Dick West, who was sitting right next to me, he said, uh, stolen? Is that kind of a harsh word? And I just looked at him and said, well, you call it whatever you like, but I call it stolen because in this manner, Byron leaned over, he was sitting next to Fran Elmer, who was sitting next to me, he said, Byron, Go to Dick's house, take whatever you want, because he's not home. What do you call that? Okay, okay, that's what Dick West was saying. Okay, I understand. So we talked about uh, at that meeting as to how to get the items back. Okay, Mr. West initially said, we can't possibly get all those items. Uh, we, need, we need a window of four years in advance, and now you're talking to it's just not going to happen. And we have a we have a 55 foot totem pole. How are we going to get that up? You know, the tribe would have to foot the bill to do that. My response to that was, the tribe isn't the one that took it. Okay, it was, it was um, um, and you're the recipient of it. I believe it's your responsibility to return what was stolen from us. Fast forward to to the time for the repatriation. We wrote down everything that, that uh, was there that could be returned to us, but the challenge with that is, in order for it to be truly repatriated and to be followed appropriately, and the only one that could do that uh, at the time was Rosita Wuerl, who was the president of uh, Sea Alaska Heritage, okay? And so, and she required $1,100 payment with that information, I uh, had a con at a council meeting, addressed it with the council, and um, we realized at the time we don't have $1,100. So, but perhaps, uh, can you remember what council member it was? It said, perhaps the K Fox Corporation can pay it. So, we addressed, I should say, I addressed the the corporation board at the time and requested that they could come up with $1,100. We could have all these items returned. So with that, they, um, they agreed. Um, the contract was signed by Richard Shields because he was the chairman of the board at the time. And so 
it took a lot of effort to get totem poles from Washington, totem poles from um, Boston, from New York, um, from Washington DC and Chicago all to come together and truck across the United States at the same time to meet a boat in, I, I want to say in Washington. And it was the largest repatriated items to date at that time to be returned at one time. And also the largest piece of art, which was the 55 foot totem pole that was returned at that particular time. We had a celebration and we invited um, guests from all over, all over Southeast Alaska. And um, they put all of the totem poles up in the Ted Ferry Civic Center. So they had the house front put up and um, also at the time, At this time, um, my my aunt Cecilia White, um, she was very very sick, and she passed away um, when the totem poles landed in Seattle. And so, my aunt is the um, the oldest um, of all my aunts and uncles. Um, and she was the leader of the K-Fox dancers in, in um, Seattle. The family, the clan family made, um, made a decision to bring my aunt home and lay her in state, which means she laid there among the totem poles that we just brought back from all the museums around the country, which made things even more precious. You know, um, it made it a ceremony. It made it sacred. Like, everything was all meant to be. There was a lot of traditional protocol ceremony that took place. So the clans came out, we were able, they were able to speak the names of the clans, they were able to speak the stories and the clan crest to the audience or to the people or to the guests that were there. There was, you know, the museums came and um, the Harriman family, they had brought with them this quilt that had belonged to their family and has been in the family. Uh, I believe the quilt says, eight, 1904. Um, and so the Herman family gave the Sonia Kwan people the quilt. And so it felt like like a hundred years of healing. Um, Kate Fox Corporation did do a couple other repatriations besides the Herman expedition. Um, we did a um, human remains um, repatriation of Chief Naha. Kate Fox also did um, the repatriation of the woman shaman of Duke Island. We participate in the U.S. Small Business Administration's Small Business 8A program. We have multiple subsidiaries providing services to the U.S. federal government in areas such as IT and cybersecurity, professional services, healthcare services, as well as training services, marketing and event planning services, and logistical services. Any of our companies have a need, we're here as the back office to make sure that we provide that need for them. We're taking care of our people from an employee relations issue, that IT, all the resources as far as laptops and things are concerned, make sure that everybody's being paid on time, that uh, from a BD perspective, making sure that we have the people on staff to write the proposals, to review the proposals.
also offer a tour of our old historic cannery where we do a taste of Alaska, where you get to try different seafoods and things like that as you walk through an old Libby cannery. Um, all the canning equipment is still there and it all kind of runs and it's, it's a fun tour. As shareholders of Cape Vice Corporation, we have the opportunity to grow our community even greater. We have named this trust the Cape Fox Shareholder Tana Trust. Tana in Clinket means copper shield, which is symbolic of wealth. Our goal as a native corporation is uh, to provide economic benefit not only to our shareholder body but to our community as well. Our striving, our goal is to be interdependent, therefore it's not enough to take care of ourselves, we have to also care for others, otherwise our community is not healthy. The Cape Fox Cares program is a structured, charitable program for Cape Fox Corporation. This program allows us to give back in a meaningful way to our local communities, while also supporting employee morale. Ketchikan Innovation Hub was created to develop emerging and smart technologies that provide, enhance, and strengthen native communities. By harnessing modern technology, we can enhance the quality of life, create new opportunities, and maintain the cultural integrity of the Alaska Native people. The board um, voted unanimously to rename the Mutt Building the Richard Shields Senior Building. So my name is Kenneth Kelly White. I'm Thinkit, Sane Kwan Tekwiti. I'm Marcus Blair. I'm from the uh, Chukunadi tribe. Cape Fox. Cool. Yeah, and I'm a child of the Sane Kwan, one of the Tekwiti Tongas tribe. So Cape Fox Corporation decided that they wanted a 50th anniversary commemorative totem pole. This here is a lovebird design that was requested by the 50th anniversary committee. Up top, you have the raven. And 
And right down below, we have the eagle here. Wigs here on the side. Ears, eyes, mouth, beak, legs, claws, forming into the raven or eagle down below here. Yeah, looking at this poem, this to me was one of a beautiful accomplishments. Not only to have the Sinequan people, K Fox Corporation, as well as the Tongass tribe join us in this huge commemorative celebration. It evokes just a sense of honor, and not only for those who have a respect to their traditions, but also respect them to the artists, the culture, the people, not only for us, but also for the future generations to come. He is one of the founding board of directors of Cakewalk Corporation. You've seen him in the video, and he can actually tell you that he was one of the people that actually named our company Cakewalk Corporation. Hey, yeah.